Video Analysis of a Relationship with a Narcissist, Part 1. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. I know that you find my analyses of videos extremely helpful because then you can see live examples of the things that I talk about. Ordinarily, what I do is find footage which involves famous and infamous people and break it down for you so that you understand what's actually going on so you are able to interpret the behaviours of those individuals, for instance, Harry's wife, for instance, Alec Baldwin, or Jada Pinkett Smith, or in relation to Ben Affleck. There's various instances where I've used video footage and broken it down. Boris Johnson being interviewed being another example. And this enables me to give you real-life examples of various facets of the narcissistic dynamic, which is extremely useful for you. Here, I'm going to actually scrutinise a film, a short film, that was actually made for the purposes of showing emotional abuse taking place. The film is called Marked, and it won awards for being a short film dealing with the question of abuse in a relationship. And it's a very well done piece of film. It only lasts a few minutes, but it will enable me to show you lots of different aspects of narcissism in action. Now, naturally, we're only seeing a snippet of behavior between a man and a woman. And as I've explained to you in previous videos, we must always avoid falling into the trap of snapshotting, i.e. making a judgment that somebody is a narcissist based upon only a small amount of material. But here, we know that this film has been created to portray an abuser and his victim. And therefore, we are able, with that backdrop of understanding that's what they are, to be able to then analyse the behaviours, what is said, what is done, through that lens. So that we know that he's an abuser. We know, although they don't describe him as a narcissist, he is. And there's his victim. So we can see the dynamic between narcissist and victim, abuser and victim. We can see the things that are said, the way that there are reactions and so forth. And there's a lot to unpack from it. And we know, because of the specific roles that they're adopting in this film, that we're looking at an abuser and victim, and it's clear that he's a narcissist, even though he is not described as such. So what I'm going to do is play sections of the film and allow you to watch it and enable you to see if you can pick out various behaviours. Can you see the manipulations? Can you see aspects of the dynamic? Can you see examples of entitlement, lack of accountability, grandiosity, haughtiness? Can you see benign manipulations? Can you see malign manipulations? Do you recognise the ways that the, not, uh, the victim is reacting with regard to the way that she's being treated? Lots of different things there. So settle back, watch, and then I'll play it again and unpack it for you. This is an excellent learning opportunity. And I would ask that you ensure that you like all of these videos and that you circulate them widely as an opportunity for people to learn more about narcissism. Whilst I know many of you enjoy watching Harry's Wife, this is far more important in terms of enabling people to gain understanding. Let's start with the first clip. Sorry, I'm late. What do you mean? I've been sat here on my own looking like a total idiot. I said seven, it's seven o five. I think it's all right. You think it's all right? Don't mind me. I'm 
I spend most of my life here waiting for you anyway. Why would all this be any different, huh? Okay, there's the footage. So we see the man waiting, and immediately you will have picked up on the fact that he's irritated. And that's, of course, because he's waiting for somebody, and his girlfriend isn't there. And one would assume that she is late. Now, it's either that she is actually late, as in she's not arrived at the appointed and agreed time, or it may well be that he views her as being late through his narcissistic perspective, meaning he might have got there early and then deems that she should be there waiting for him because, of course, he's important. He shouldn't be left waiting for her. His narcissism, therefore, is in effect telling him that he's not important because he has to sit there waiting. Now, interestingly, as and you'll see, as, as you saw, rather, there doesn't appear to be anybody else around them. So it's not like there are other couples that are looking across and thinking, oh, look at Billy No Mates, or he's been stood up. He's just sat there on his own. So in actual fact, his own sensation of being left waiting and what that means, of being made to feel an idiot, is a concoction of his own paranoia, which of course is being generated by his narcissism. Were he not a narcissist, he would probably just sit there and think to himself, she'll be along shortly, and you can see that he's busy in, busying himself with his phone. He could have messaged her to ask, where are you? Or he would just catch up on the day's news, etc., knowing that she would be along shortly, confident in the fact that that would be the case. However, here, the fact that she has not turned up at the appointed time, either the one that's agreed or the one that he has arbitrarily fixed, signals that he's not important. And because she's the intimate partner primary source, her failure to turn up in person is causing substantial wounding to him. The irritation that we see is his narcissism keeping the ignited fury under control. He's not at the stage of standing up and flinging the tables around in the restaurant or the glasses, primarily because she's not there to see it, but also because there's likely to be some degree of facade management with this particular narcissist. So instead, we can see the churning fury underneath there, which shows as irritation on the surface, as he's being repeatedly wounded by each minute passing that his girlfriend isn't there. His girlfriend then arrives and kisses him. That is the provision of fuel, and it's in person, and it's an intimate act, and therefore that's quite a large dollop of fuel that he receives. But notice he doesn't turn to embrace her. His expression doesn't change to one of delight and, oh, here you are, lovely to see you. She also apologises for being late. The kiss and her apology demonstrate that she's under control. But note his eyes. See how they narrow and darken. Because although he's received fuel, it is insufficient to deal with the extent of the wounding that he has experienced. And while she's showing that she's under control, his narcissism dictates, we need more fuel from her. Her failure to turn up on time has wounded our narcissist significantly, if you will, punched holes in the construct, so that precious fuel has leaked away and needs now to be replaced. And that dollop, sizable as it was that she's just supplied by virtue of the kiss and the apology, is not sufficient to make up the deficit. And thus, he experiences that sensation of emptiness that he's repeatedly on a daily basis seeking to fill up. And his narcissism directs him, essentially, to provoke her further for the purposes of making sure that she remains under control, but primarily to get more fuel from her to deal with the deficit that has been created as a consequence of the wounding. You may have noticed that he looked either side as he leant forward to speak to her. That's facade management, checking that there's nobody around to hear what he's about to say. Where have you been, he questions. Assertion of control by challenging question. I've been sat on my own, looking like a total idiot. This is demonstrative of his victim mentality. Only he thinks that he looks like an idiot. There's nobody else there to actually see. 
It's also done to provoke her and make her feel guilty, various forms of manipulation. She responds, We said 7pm, it's 7.05. There'll be many of you who have found yourself in this situation. From her perspective, it's not a major issue whatsoever. She's five minutes after the appointed time. It's not like she's turned up half an hour late. And she then explains, I think it's all right. Of course, this is a red rag to the narcissist. And he responds accordingly. Her dismissiveness of suggesting it's only five minutes and it's okay, or seen ordinarily, will be viewed by people as, it's only five minutes, you've been in a relationship, you know that might be, she's periodically a little bit late, it's no biggie, it's not like you've been there waiting for ages, wondering if she's going to turn up. You could have also contacted her if you need to do so. But no, that is all irrelevant. Because at this moment in time, she's painted black. And the narcissism is essentially in the subconscious saying, she needs to be put in her place, we need to get more fuel from her, and she's just challenged again by suggesting that her tardiness is acceptable. Accordingly, he responds, you think it's all right. Don't mind me. I'm going to spend most of my life here waiting for you. Why should this be any different? He belittles her, and it's a provocation designed to make her feel bad, and to assert control over her, of course, and draw fuel from her. Notice the reaction of the lady. She's immediately crestfallen as a consequence of his barbed comment, but also you can see that she's thinking, uh-oh, it's going to be one of those evenings again, is it? She's well used to this treatment. Let's move on in part two to more analysis of this excellent film. <laughs>